And our first question would be, to which degree um, are you a research team and to which degree are you two individual researchers with their individual research interests? And it's very hard to give you a precise percentage. We do some things together. Beth has got her own work that she does. And I have other things, particularly in the area of material science, and which don't involve Beth uh, directly, at any rate. We don't co-author papers on material science. But they all, a lot of the hydrogeology and karst-related work, uh, both of us are involved in. When one looks at your papers, there, and uh, also on your website, there's such a wide range, uh, such a wide range of research topics, ranging from physics, chemistry, whatever, crystallography, and geoscience is just one subtopic, and hydrogeology, cast hydrogeology is just just seems to be the subtopic of a subtopic, and we would like to know, Beth, how does he do this? By not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> he actually has 17 different fields. 17 different fields. No, I reduced it to 15. <laughs> 15. Is this related to your retirement? <laughs> or? <laughs> There's a story. There's always a story. And the story is, I write a proposal, let's say for research, oh, let's say a research on the structure of glass, which is one of those items. And the reviewer says, oh, this is a very nice proposal, but it's apparent uh, from Professor White's bibliography that he doesn't give this subject his full attention. And he votes against funding the proposal. And I'm thinking, you know, why should I have to give my full attention to a proposal which is going to support one graduate student? Uh, so I decided to subdivide everything into a range of topics. And then for any particular proposal, I attach the bibliography that's appropriate to the proposal. And I got away with that for a long time. Each of these were little isolated categories, and nobody in those categories knew about any of the others. <laughs> <laughs> and could you name these 17 or now only 50 main fields of research interest? I'm not sure I can name them all, but there is uh, crystal chemistry, high temperature, phase equilibria, thermodynamics is one, uh, infrared and Raman spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy is another, uh, luminescence uh, and luminescence spectroscopy and phosphors and phosphor materials uh, is a third of these. Uh, the uh, materials, let's see, there is uh, sulfide and calcogenide infrared window materials and related subjects. There's uh, the, uh, I mentioned glass, which is mostly dealing with the structure of glass uh, one way and another. There is uh, materials uh, processing, crystal growth, uh, ceramic processing, sintering processes, uh, so on. Uh, there's in Environmental sciences dealing with nuclear waste. I've written a fair number of papers on nuclear waste management. Uh, environmental science dealing with mine land remediation and uh, several subjects of that kind. Uh, I actually, the karst is separated into geomorphology, hydrogeology, and mineralogy. But then a fairly large category is mineral physics with the idea of applying condensed matter physics to problems in neurology. I doubt that's all 15 of them. I'm not sure what I left out. But I think I, I left out. 14. <laughs> 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 but which are the two subjects that you skipped? To I was, your work at on? one time, was hem I remember the one I skipped. It was aqueous geochemistry and the geochemistry of aqueous solutions. Ah. But the one that I skipped was organic. Uh, uh, crystal chemistry and relationship between crystal structure of organic compounds and some very peculiar physical properties, organic semiconductors and 
things of that kind. Mm -hmm. And the other had to do with element partitioning in, uh, for example, Adidas melts, and how is it that all the nickel winds up with the olivine and not uh, some, not in the alkaline metals end up in the glass and questions of that kind. They never got enough done on either of those two subjects to really justify keeping them, so mm -hmm. I dropped them off. Even though 17 is a nice prime number, 15 isn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you attack these subjects in a sequential way, or you just want to change subjects every 10 years? Because it, it seems like you do them all at once. Not every okay. 10 years, because every, then you would. Every four years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you've accumulated a lot of baggage over the years. I keep finding new things, and I never discard any of the old things. So we just keep piling more and more bricks on the cart. And as we mostly know you both as cast scientists and hydrologists, hydrogeologists, what if, is the role of cast hydrogeology for? for both of you. How important is it for you? Is it just one fifteenth? No, actually it's considerably more. Well, it would have been three fifteenths anyway. Ah, oh yes. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now this is something that's sort of been near and dear to us for a lot of years because there's at least uh, 30 years so, 40 years ago, there was no justification for studying this, in fact, it would have been academic suicide to decide that I'm going to be a karst hydrogeologist and uh, tell my department head that's what I'm going to use as my specialty. Mm -hmm. He would have been looking for a replacement faculty member very quickly. So, mm -hmm. and because it's become more popular, there are more sessions at the Geological Society of America meeting now which we didn't used to have at all. We'll have many, many sessions on karst hydrogeology. And how did you come to karst hydrogeology, Ben? Because I married Will. Oh, <laughs> so you are co-operators and co-partners. <laughs> I was mostly interested in surface water hydrology. Yeah. And then I was looking for a position at Penn State, and so I applied and was working in cement and concrete research, and that's how I came to do the paper on fly ash, mm -hmm. and fly ash mixtures with the cement. Mm -hmm. I have also done a lot of, I will call it, applying the, the statistics of the stock market to some of the surface water hydrology. Mm -hmm. And so Will said, let's go on a date to the cave. Oh, and you said, okay. no, it wasn't. <laughs> this, it's a more interesting story. We want to hear it. Yes. We want to hear that. I wasn't looking for a girlfriend. I was looking for somebody who knew how to operate a transit. Uh, <laughs> because we had this, had this drainage basin down in West Virginia where there was a number of caves separated by, oh, I don't know, 500 meters, a kilometer or so. And we wanted to plot up all these cave surveys on a common framework within the, along with the surface channels. And so inquiring around, I found out that there was this uh, female civil engineer at the University of Pittsburgh. And, uh, enticed her to bring her surveying equipment uh, <laughs> down to West Virginia and ran the overland surveys uh, between uh, these various cave entrances. And that really was our first date. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said he was trying to be funny and tell them the story about Overholt. <laughs> He tells them that you were the one who got too spooked by that one. <laughs> All of the cavers went into a cave, and it's called Overhaul Blowing Cave, and they left outside just the other fellow civil engineer and I, who didn't know the way into the cave. And so we went in, and going in the cave, we didn't know which way to go, mm -hmm. and so we went through the water. They went through the dry, and then, <laughs> and then 
as we were coming around the corner, all of them screamed. <laughs> that was my introduction to my first trip into a cave. <laughs> But still, you you keep kept on and still keep on liking caves and investigating caves. Right. Yeah. And it seems that maybe the mammoth cave was is a very important cave for your research because you've already ri also written a book together about uh, about the mammoth cave and the hydro geological hydrological observations you did there. Yeah, in the. Um late 50s and early 60s, the uh, Cave Research Foundation was trying to establish itself and furthermore trying to establish credentials with the National Park Service so they could permission to survey in Mammoth Cave, which at that time the only part of the cave that was accessible was what was called the Flint Ridge Cave System. It was the part of Mammoth that's north of the historically important Mammoth Cave. So they were looking for people who might offer some scientific credentials to and do serious scientific research. And so we were invited to come down in 1961 and spend a month down there um, doing various small studies within the cave system. Mm -hmm. And in 62, 63, we were down there for a period of years, very actively in the 60s. Not terribly much since then, at least in the Mammoth Cave area. But uh, it was a great place to do some work, and it was a great place to establish cave-related work as a legitimate scientific activity. And all in your, in all the caves that you've been in, been to, how lost have you been? Have you ever gone lost or had a? I'm not the no, lost. really. Occasionally the entrance has been lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you knew exactly where you were. I knew where I was. <laughs> no, I don't think. I can't remember. No. 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 no really. I thought we might get a no from you and a yes from you that, that he has been lost. No. <laughs> and, um, Bill, what do you think, which are the most in important discoveries or breakthroughs that Beth made in the field of hydrology, hydrogeology, uh, cast and cave science? Probably find that master's thesis. <laughs> Beth's, Beth's big contribution, and uh, big enough that we decided to include it in the benchmark paper in this uh, benchmark book, uh, was looking at, looking at uh, karst drainage basins from the point of view of surface water hydrology, where surface water hydrologists typically establish a gauge somewhere down the mouth of the drainage basin, and they look at hydrographs, and they look at annual floods, and they look at the statistics of these things, return periods, and so on. And she did a master's thesis in which her advisor, uh, it wasn't me, by the way, uh, suggested that she look at a fairly big series of watersheds in Pennsylvania to see if you could predict the annual flood from the geomorphic characteristics of the drainage basin. So she did this, and she noticed when she was examining her data that the handful of carbonate karstic basins, five basins, Five basins were behaved completely different than all of the other. Most, a lot of Pennsylvania is underlain by shales and sandstones and all of this kind of thing. And so she looked at this much more carefully and came up with this discovery that the, uh, if you look at floods in a drainage basin, not just in the cave system, but in the drainage basin itself. All the water pours down into the caves, fills up the conduits, fills up the trough and the groundwater table, and the effect is to clip the tops off the hydrographs and spread the hydrographs out so that the peak floods in karstic drainage basins, or moderate sized floods in any way, tend to be much more subdued. The much less serious floods in the karst than there were in these sandstone and shale basins um, around it. So she wrote this up in the paper in the Journal of Hydrology with her name and her advisor's name. 
I'm not sure her advisor ever read the paper, but it's his most famous paper. Uh -huh. <laughs> and when you when you author papers or books together, do you have a system for getting along and doing this at the same time, or how does well, we that didn't work? get a divorce over that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, we mostly work pretty informally of talking stuff back and forth and. Uh, Beth likes to concentrate on the data and making sure the data is well presented. And I tend to babble on about uh, possible implications of the data and this kind of thing. And somehow, eventually, it winds up in a manuscript. Mm -hmm. so. We have an office which we have our desks are facing each other, and then our computers are behind. So when we work on our computers, we are have backs to each other. <laughs> but when we're working on our desk, we're sitting there facing each other about this distance apart. So. And maybe a question uh, to you, Beth. What do you think are the most important uh, discoveries of Bill in the field of hydrology, hydrogeology, cast, cave research? Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I want to hear the answer. Nothing, <laughs> <special. laughs> yeah, 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 not, nothing special to nothing report. Because, because yeah. I guess if I was going to pick something, I would have picked something in the infrared or the glass material because I like to hear about all of this glass material work because I think that is very fascinating. Mm -hmm. But I know about the hydrology already, whereas I don't know mm -hmm. anything about the glass. Uh. Well, well it, I would like to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. You look, you prepare a paper and you look at it and you say, this is, this is really nice. This really went together well. I really like this. You send it to the journal and it's like <laughs> dropping a stone into a pond, you know, with a few ripples and it's gone and there's no trace left behind. And other times I'm writing something because, you know, I've got a deadline and I've got to write this thing. And so I write something and I send it off and it winds up being cited all over the place. I have no ability to guess which is going to turn out to be interesting to somebody else. But in my own opinion, there were a couple of things that came up that I thought probably made a small, at least a small step forward. One was the realization that if you're going to talk about groundwater flow in carbonate aquifers, that the, and you're going to talk about caves evolving and developing, You've got to take into account the fact that these flows are in the turbulent regime. Yeah, yeah. I think the model and this was back in the huh, 1960, 61, long, long time ago, and long before anybody else took this subject very seriously. Mm -hmm. And that was never written up formally. It was actually written up in a caterer's newsletter as a paper, which I had seen quoted all over the place. Uh, it would, I never really formalized it because I could never get the mathematics quite straight in my own mind. Mm -hmm. And the number thing, which was also never written up exactly, uh, was the notion that there are these thresholds which have to be crossed to, for, for a fracture system to evolve into a karst system. Mm -hmm. That uh, there is, of course, the onset of turbulence once the apertures get sufficiently large. Uh, that's fine, we knew about that. The notion that the kinetics of limestone shift gears and shift to a faster regime whenever the aperture reaches a certain value. And something which I think still hasn't really been developed completely, the idea that at some point the aquifer begins to transmit clastic sediment and not just water. The clastics are no longer filtered out by the small openings and start to move through as part of the flux through the system. We gave a paper on that subject at a uh, meeting in 1960. They were going to publish the proceedings. They did publish the proceedings. The paper Bet wrote was published in the proceedings. Uh, I never got around to finishing writing up the one that has these, this critical sort of 
threshold idea, and so that's never really been formally presented anywhere either, but we talk about it all the time. And uh, <clears throat> actually, probably as much of it as anything is simply trying to penetrate the uh, sort of conceptual framework that the traditional hydrogeologists have used for years and years and years, that porous media flow is the name of the game, uh, the uh, physics of porous media flow is, is very elegant, as developed by M. King Hubbard in his classic paper back in 1942, 1940. And uh, the idea was, by the professional hydrologists in this 1960s time frame, was the caves were at most a little blip in the flow field. But, you know, the cavers were getting carried away by the fact they could go in there and splash around in the water, but really back in the rock there was this uniform flow field moving through the, the mass of the rock. And the cave itself was just, say, a blip, a small distortion at best, and of no particular importance. And we wrote, the late Vic Schmidt and I wrote a paper back in 1966, uh, essentially trying to establish that most of the water in this drainage basin was moving through the caves. There. And a number of upper water balance calculations showed that most of the water is moving through the conduits. And as Steve Worthington has tried to show, there's a lot of water sitting in storage in the pores and the fractures, but it's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think those things were probably of some interest mm -hmm. along the way. I might just interject a quick question. <clears throat> if I remember right, the, the paper you're talking about with Victor Schmidt was in Water Resources Research. Yeah. Do you know, were there any papers about caves in Water Resources Research prior to that? Not that I'm aware of, no. And Bet, um, for, for you, um, with your experience in civil engineering and then in hydrogeology, how does that, how do they influence each other? Or do you experience, experience any conflict between your, your subject areas or have they complemented each other well, do you think? Well, when I, I had my advisor and I showed him a photograph of the limestone with conduits in it, he said, "No, this is not correct. They are they are little little pockets, just like Will was talking about. You don't you don't have mm -hmm. a continuous flow." Mm -hmm. And I, I said, "No, no, that's not correct." Yeah. And so I just had that sort of conflict. I don't see that mm -hmm. I had any mm -hmm. conflicts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what are there lessons that you took from hydrogeology and applied to? engineering or, or vice versa in your career? Well, I was applying some of the flow characteristics, measuring the permeability of some of the cements that I was making. And these were high temperature cements, these were mm -hmm. mixtures of others, and so we were able to use the civil engineering hydrology to mm -hmm. tell them what's going on. Actually, it was an important lesson, which is to field check your watersheds. Oh. It wouldn't, once you're doing your PhD work, it wouldn't have occurred to the engineers who were doing this surface water statistics. They would pull the data off of the database, like the USGS surface water records, and start plugging stuff into the computer. And that actually went around to those 62 watersheds and visited almost all of them. All of them talk through them, look for limestone contacts, look for features, uh, actually feel, and her committee was amazed that somebody would do this. And this was an engineering committee, not a, in the geology department, it wouldn't be surprising if somebody was field checking their work. And there are not, not very many people who have a full professor as their field assistant. <laughs> <laughs> After I stopped working for Penn State, I worked for an engineering company. Mm -hmm. And one of the projects was to build an insurance building mm -hmm. on one of the corners in downtown State College. Mm -hmm. And when uh, they showed me this, this area, this uh, 
this proposed building, which was going to be a four-story building. And I looked, because I'm interested in engineering, I looked at the soils maps, I looked at the geology map, and I also went out to look at the site. When I was out there, I found that there was, depth, there was limestone shown, and so I went out and looked, and in this field were, in underneath the brush areas, were huge holes in limestone. Limestone was actually came to the surface, and they, they were actually going to put one of the corners of this main insurance building over one of these holes. And when they I looked at what the surveyors showed, they didn't show any of this karst on the surface. And so when I went back to the engineering, the company, the company president, and I said, this is what you have. And then the next project that I was working on, they had uh, a lot of um, runoff from, from a building, and it was also feeding into the ground, and there was a big hole developed where they were going to build a shopping center. Mm -hmm. And my, the boss, the president of the company said, you are looking at everything through karst colored glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and it meant that they were, they could not approve this, actually this insurance company then sold that land, and then it became just a, just an area with grass. Maybe a question to both of you. Um, in your opinion, which are the important questions that are still to be resolved by the younger generation of hydrogeologists, but also karst and cave scientists? You already mentioned some, but maybe there's more. Well, as um, Yogi Berra once said, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> yeah. um, but the two areas which at present look to be the most productive, the first is hydrogeology, and particularly constructing a, a functional model for cars. I, uh, the way I've expressed this is to say we don't have it yet, but I think I can see the glow of one just over the horizon. And I think some of the work, particularly by colleagues in Germany, for instance, are making very good progress in this direction. Uh, what that will lead to in terms of new observations and fitting data and cross-checking models and changing the way in which we evaluate karst aquifers, I'm not quite sure. But that's a very important area, and it's moving ahead very rapidly. Uh, the other <coughs> is uh, use of cave deposits, paleofounds, as paleoclimate archives. And this particular uh, discovery, really, or came to light or seriously, probably by no later than 1995, hardly more than 10 years ago. And again, it's an area which has sort of exploded in terms of the amount of literature, their studies uh, in Europe, in the United States, in China, um, Africa, South Africa in particular, a lot of places, which um, I think that that's going to turn out to be, that the cave records are going to turn out to be every bit as important as the ice cores. Now that may be Some a certain say that they are the best record of climate change, but they are already better than the ice core. Well, we have to learn to read the record, and I don't think we quite know how to read the record yet. There was a lot of initial things, and there's been, I know there was at least one equation published that said, okay, you get the uh, oxygen isotope ratio, you plug it, and the deuterium hydrogen ratio, and you plug the numbers in this formula, and punch it out on your pocket calculator that gives you the temperature. And I think that's probably a little bit optimistic right now. But I don't see any reason why it can't be done, and I think that we're getting there. Um, the great advantage of speleothems as uh, records is that there are caves all over the place, and particularly in temperate and tropical regions where it's hard to find other records. And uh, 
Well, I support <laughs> religions that are not very successful <laughs> in the tropics. It's true. It's yeah. very high. And the numbers, so you have the cores from Greenland, you have the cores from Antarctica, particularly the Vostok cores and so on. It's a very, these are great. People learn all kinds of good things from those cores. But I think that what you can learn from the ice cores is probably, you know, plateauing out at the present time. And uh, there are, I don't think we've even completely explored everything that's in the cave records. People are just beginning to look, for example, at strontium isotopes. And I'm not sure what this tells you right now, but people are measuring them. Uh, there's trace other trace elements, minor trace elements, not there's been work done on magnesium, strontium, a little bit on barium, but there's other trace metals, very minor elements that you could easily analyze for with the ICPMS, and uh, you know they'll tell us things about crystal growth and crystal growth in turn relating to trip rates and the process. Connecting the process in the cave to what's going on on the surface is a key issue, and that's what's being worked on right now. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned climate. Um, well, one thing is to reconstruct the paleoclimate using spelio themes or other methods, but there's also a big discussion about mm -hmm. climate change and how it will impact, let's say, life on Earth, <laughs> and um, also what will be the impact of climate change on, on water resources. Do you think that hydrogeologists need to do more research in this field or what, what is your opinion about this uh, problematic? You know, it's not entirely easy to predict what the effects of climate change are going to be. Uh, and there is a number of people who have said like, you know, don't worry about it, just be prepared to move. <laughs> Uh, because if, see, if we do in fact succeed in melting the major ice caps, we get 8, 10 meters of sea level rise and uh, Miami becomes more like Venice. Um, okay, so what are you going to do about it? Well, the easiest thing to do about it is move out and uh, in the long run it would probably be cheaper to move out than to put Miami on stilts. But uh, nobody wants to move out. People are going to rebuild New Orleans in spite of the fact that a city built below sea level in the bowl is about as stupid as anything I can think of doing. But uh, don't tell a jazz musician that. Um, so what's likely to happen is that the climate is going to get itself reorganized. The temperature, temperate zone will move north. Um, People who are freezing to death in the wintertime now may find themselves very comfortable. Uh, desertification may turn out to be a major problem. And what could be devastating for um, humankind is if some of the major food productive areas decide to turn into deserts because of shifts in atmospheric circulation patterns. And uh, so personal. This is a strictly personal opinion, one not very many people probably agree with. I think the easiest thing to do is try to learn to live with it. And I uh, mean, the climate we have now is not the climate that we had uh, beginning of the Holocene. Certainly not the climate that we had uh, in the middle of the uh, last glaciation. Uh, it's not the climate that we had in the last interglacial. Climate has changed and changed and changed and changed. And they, our <clears throat> remote ancestors somehow learned to live with it. At least they must have because we're here. <laughs> and, okay, uh, this was the big global picture, but I would like to know more specifically um, if you think that hydrogeologists should do more research in this direction. For example, study yes. the impact of climate change on groundwater resources and things like this. Well, what I just said was that um, you know, major changes in uh, atmospheric circulation patterns mean major changes in rainfall, which means major changes in groundwater flow. Areas with plentiful water resources right now may turn out not to have any water resources. Uh, you may not have to abandon your city because it's going underwater. 
that you may have to abandon your city because it lacks a water supply. And uh, I mean, there are those who would claim that the Mayan civilization of Yucatan collapsed for exactly that reason. They had uh, done their agriculture and their uh, slash and burn style of farming, cleared off the land, all the soil washed down into it and turned the Yucatan Peninsula into a karst desert. And, uh, and now you've got a bunch of big piles of stone in the middle of the jungle. And I think we're in some danger of the same, and I think this is a very serious issue for hydrogeologists, and they ought to be trying to predict if, since you can't really tell what the climate's going to do, if it does this, then what's the impact on water and water resources? If it does something else, what's the impact? And just make up scenarios and then play them through and come up with, say, okay, these are the things we would have to watch out for. Yeah, as it's in China, first I want to show uh, the welcome and appreciate yeah, your couple, your coming to China and to our school to give lectures to our students, and it, they are very wonderful. And uh, um, uh, I have some question for uh, Professor Y. Because mm, uh, uh, since now uh, nowadays uh, doing science scientific research is really hard and it's very hard to uh, come to a higher step and uh, how can we especially the young generation uh, to find uh, an appropriate or a, a breakthrough point then to uh, make progress to achieve um, do you have any suggestions yeah, yeah? the first is don't pay any attention to your professors <laughs> because those of us who are, you know, managed to survive all these years and have sort of got a picture of what we think is important and the areas that are worthwhile, and this is okay. You can tell a student this would be a good project and you can write a master's thesis. Or a PhD thesis about the results. But this is not likely to really result in a major breakthrough. The major breakthrough occurs when someone with a very young brain sees the world differently than all of these distinguished people with old brains. <laughs> and if you look at the history, the history that I know best is the history of physics, uh, the really important breakthroughs were made by very young people who were looking at the world in a very different way than the hair doctor professors because they were mostly German. <laughs> that's, that's really the most useful piece of advice I can give you, Chuck, but is to try to look at the look at your subject of interest yourself and try to put together your own conceptual model, your conceptual so picture, your worldview if you like. And then see, is there something there that these old geezers are overlooking? Okay, and then go for that. And you may very well come through with a major breakthrough. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I wonder, since, since uh, how to say, uh, with time goes by, and how to keep the, uh, the enthusiasm and the vigor of uh, of wonder wine of the world and uh, unfailing childlike appetite of, of the world. Because we we, uh, we we are all uh, common people. We we must face the uh, daily life, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, in other world, um, we want to uh, do some something uh, that keep uh, how to say um, make uh, make a. Uh, make us keep young in our, uh, not only the body, but the, uh, our mind. Yeah. You'll find that some of the most successful scientists in the world are those that have succeeded in doing exactly that. That they have uh, 
just continuously interested in everything that comes along. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they yeah. don't get too carried away by the importance of their own position and they're not, you know, it's, you need to have a sufficient income to have food on the table and a roof over your yeah. head. Um, they always talk about the poets that work starving in an attic someplace, but it's never been demonstrated that you write better poetry if you're starving in an attic than <laughs> if you have a comfortable apartment with, with plenty to eat. Um, but you've got to maintain this interest in things that are going on. New things are happening all the time. And so the trick is not to get too preoccupied with your particular specialty. You become the most important person in your specialty and you're so busy going around being important that you don't have time to really look at any new things. Mm -hmm. So you need to avoid that trap. But I don't know what else to tell you. Just keep, keep you've got it exactly right. Keep, Keep the pressure out of it. Enjoy what's going on. But it, it's always easier said than done. <laughs> now I want to, maybe I should put it in here where we can do this, you know, about people who maintain a continuous outlook on things. Yeah. I, um, I was interested in karst because I was interested in caves and because that was something separate from what I was doing. I was a chemistry major and I was moving into physics and I was a physics major. And uh, when I went back to Penn State to get a PhD in, in 1958, uh, having decided that the physicists were kind of a strange bunch and the geologists were all out having fun, so uh, maybe geology is better. My advisor at Penn State was a very remarkable fellow named Rustin Roy, who has worked in all kinds of fields. He's one of the few people I've ever met that I really would say was a genius. And uh, at about the time that I was getting a degree in geochemistry, uh, Rustin decided to put together a thing he called the Materials Research Laboratory, and he invited me to join this thing which is how I drifted back and all of a sudden my knowledge of physics suddenly becomes interesting and useful. And I wind up doing physics on materials and some work I had done earlier on spectroscopy and turns out to be interesting. And in the meantime, I'm still in the Department of Geosciences and all kinds of things can happen and they all happen in parallel. And it wasn't any particular, you know, it was just being open to all of this stuff. Every crazy idea that Rustam came in with, I said, oh, that's a good, interesting, crazy idea. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very helpful. Yeah. You know, why, why are caves essentially you know, major single passages and not the way Beth's advisor thought they were, little, little holes like a piece of cheese mm -hmm. all through the limestone? And then the question of how could, the, how could these things get initiated in the first place if the uh, um, water came to equilibrium in the epicars right at the base of the soil. And that uh, shift in the kinetics, which in fact was, that whole idea was based on work done by a couple of oceanographers who were interested in carbonate chemistry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I really pull Bob Berner and John Morris a rotten trick on that one because uh, if you look at their paper in the American Journal of Science in 1974, that really, John Morris, part of his PhD thesis, really did a beautiful study using this pH stat on the kinetics. And they put in an appendix with all their data in it and just a little sketch. So I plotted up their data, which is always good. Plot up, I prefer to plot up other people's data. It's a lot less work. <laughs> um, and here are these nice curves in the, in the, on the acid mine drainage regime. The curve comes down. Rates are proportional to hydrogen ion activities. And there's a wide zone in which uh, the rate is pretty fast, but not essentially independent of CO2 pressure, you know, under saturation. And then you get within this point three of the saturation index. Of, equilibrium and the rate drops like a rock over about three orders of magnitude. And that was all implicit in their data. 
And I took their data, put the idea, and then took another rate equation, and then a bit of elementary fluid mechanics for the movement of water through small fractures, and kind of ground all that up together, and lo and behold, there was the kinetic threshold. And do you remember like a, a single moment where, I mean, just in terms of how you designed, do you remember a single this, moment when that came together? Probably at 3 o'clock in the morning when I hit a deadline. Um, this was the, I, uh, the IAH meeting in Huntsville, Alabama back right. in 1975. And that proceedings? And I had, there was never a piece of politics involved with that in that uh, Phil Amaro, who was organizing the thing, had invited the senior guys, the old guys, to come to this meeting on limestone hydrology. And he basically was, I had heard rumor to the effect that they didn't really want a bunch of these punk cavers <laughs> showing up at their meeting. And I thought, now that's a pretty rotten attitude. <laughs> um, and uh, so I made sure that I spread the word all through the community. So a whole bunch of us showed up with paper. They couldn't very well turn us away. And I needed a paper. I needed a paper for this meeting. So I said, what can I do? And I don't have much time. And I obviously can't go out and do any field work or anything. So, ah, I can make some calculations. And I made some calculations. And I thought, wow, this is pretty neat. Right. Yeah. I would also yeah, have sorry. another question. <laughs> you gave, before you gave the advice that the young researcher shouldn't listen to what the the old professor says, and so on. I mean, you are also an old professor. That's right. Did you, uh, do you have some experiences to report about, let's say, a young PhD student or a young student working with you who just didn't care what you said <laughs> and then made a great discovery? Yes. yes. Can you but tell I us very, more about I have very, very carefully tried not to discourage. You know, this is where the old professors have choices. They can say, you know, look, you know, get out of here, get out, you know, you'll do what I tell you, and if you don't do what I tell you, go look for another advisor. Or they can be constantly listening for new ideas they come from. And I think of my graduate students, of the PCs I supervise, the number of which is something like 84, uh, I'd say that there's a certain number in which it's been sort of a collaborative effort. The student does a pretty good job, gets a certain amount of discussion and input. There's a, one end of that distribution curve that are students who were led by the hand to their degree. I mean, there is a place for people who are just careful, plodding workers with no imagination at all. And so, okay, they can make a living. They can support their family. This is okay. But at the other end, the group of students from whom I learned more than they ever learned from me. And I prize those students. Uh, they taught me a lot. Well, the one last one I have, and then I'll, then I'll be quiet. Um, and that's, the, I, don't, I don't know if there's an answer. In fact, both of you might uh, suggest an answer if you do. And that is, you were also, um, in answer to uh, kind of Nico's question, um, talking about the uh, sort of the, like you know new new advances in terms of, of new techniques and you admit, like talk, talking about for instance in the isotopes and the climate stuff you mentioned strontium and some things that kind of people were working on that you know were kind of at, at the edge and I guess I'd like to sort of ask if if you if you do have any like sort of vision or, or suspicions of things like e even further out there and, and what I mean is I'll just kind of use Daryl Granger for an example is the stuff with the cosmogenic isotopes and dating. Um, you know, at least for me, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, something like that, it, it, I just didn't even, it just had no existence for me. And, you know, here's something that's brand new and opens up all these things. Yeah. Is there anything that, that now, I, I guess, you know, putting ourselves sort of back then, sort of thinking, thinking forward, I guess, or, you know, or, or from now, you know, with that same concept, is there anything that's, that you, like, suspect you know, might be one of those that, that's out there that, that, if you follow what I mean, not, not something that somebody's working on, but it's not clear, but, but is, is there some area or something? If I knew what it was, I'd hop onto it. Right, right. Uh, well, maybe that you can't figure well, out how to do it, but you no, just maybe somebody will work. Barrels work with uh, the cosmogenic isotope dating and plastic sediments has been a, a major breakthrough in the last few years because it gives us some anchor points if we're trying to interpret the evolution of karst landscapes. Right. 
and we're using major cave passages as markers, essentially. We've gone the whole run. We, we started out, you know, figure, well, maybe you could date the cave by its relationship to a river terrace. Now you date the river terrace by its relationship to the cave, for which you have cosmogenic dates on the sediments. And I've only got a handful of anchor points because Daryl's only turned out a handful of anchor points. So are there others? Yes, there may very well be. Uh, other measurements used other places. Study of karst is always advanced by uh, uh, swiping concepts, methods, techniques, equipment from somewhere else. You say, hey, you know, that could be applied to, to karst work, and then you figure out how to do it. But, uh, so I don't have any doubt that it's out there. Mm. But no, do I see something coming over the hill that nobody else sees just yet? But not yet. <laughs> You'd be doing it. <laughs> right. Thanks, Nico. I would uh, still have another question. Now we mostly spoke really about science, but here we are now in China in context with the environmental health project. And of course, hydrogeology is not just about science. It's also about safe drinking water for the people. It has to do with public health, welfare, and so on. Where do you see, let's say, modern hydrogeology in this context? What can hydrogeologists do to help the world, let's say? Well, let's say that the objective is save water supplies. No water people perish. Uh, the role of hydrogeology is to lay out the scientific foundation, is to say to the authorities, the uh, agencies, whoever is ultimately making the decisions about this, this is what you've got to work with. Here are the places where water supplies can be damaged, as you were discussing this morning, where water supplies can be damaged. Uh, don't put that paper mill in this particular valley. It's, you know, it's going to cause all kinds of environmental harm uh, or whatever. Now, the, there's no guarantee that the politicians will pay any attention to it. But on the other hand, if the politicians, the policy makers, the administrators don't have this kind of information, then they can really do some stupid things, as history amply demonstrates. So, I think that's the role of the hydrogeology, is to make sure these, that these guys, if they make a wrong decision, they at least make the wrong decision knowing what the situation was, and they decided to make the wrong decision anyway. <laughs>